welcome to the show. Thank you. Oh, it's so great to be here. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you. You walked in and you got a standing ovation, and you weren't even funny yet. <laughs> you got it before. Well, I should leave now. Then <laughs> I'm a little nervous about that. You're going on the road and you're doing a long Q and A. You're kind of doing what. A lot yes, of people got to yep. see you doing television. What's it like to be on the road and answering those questions well, again? Well, it's terrific. I, I uh, go out in front of the audience, and I do 90 minutes of uh, just bump up the lights, and if you want to ask a question, raise your hand, and I'll, it's all random. Mm -hmm. And I never know when it, anybody's going to ask, so it really keeps the gray matter working. You know? <laughs> yeah. that's, that's really fun and why I do it. What's the weirdest question you, you've ever gotten? <laughs> <laughs> Now keep in mind, no, no, this I is know, 11 o'clock, no. and it's also Canadian, not American well, television. So you can <laughs> say whatever you want. <laughs> well, it was weird. Uh, this woman, uh, it was in Texas. Well, of course, that kind of goes the way it should. <laughs> In Texas. Uh, anyway, she was up in the balcony, and and I saw her, and she was raising her hand. And she, I said, "Yes, the lady in the pink," and she said, "Carol." If you could be a member of the opposite sex for 24 hours and then pop back into being yourself again, who would you be and what would you do? <laughs> wow. I'm thinking, oh, look, would I want to be Cary Grant? But if I was Cary Grant, then what would I do? And my mind was going a mile a minute. And then I just said to my higher power, I said, whatever comes out, dear God, <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> and I said, I'd be Osama bin Laden and I'd kill myself. Good answer. I bet you if somebody came up with a list of a million people, Carol Burnett would say, Osama would not make that list. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> now, did you thank God or blame God for that no, answer? No, I, I thank God for that answer, yeah. But think of this, you're actually from Texas, right? You're yes, I am. Born in San Antonio. San so. Antonio. And then uh -huh. you're really young and you, and you made the move to Hollywood, right? Yeah, I was seven. Yeah, back in the covered wagon days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, we're watching all that, that footage back of, of your career and all the things. Uh -huh. It, man, what a long, strange trip it must have been for you, especially considering that when you were a little girl living with your grandmother, you guys were so broke that you would steal cutlery and salt and pepper from restaurants and toilet paper from bathrooms. Uh-huh. I mean, what, 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 what kind of mark did that leave on you, that, those early days with your grandma? Well, it just meant when we would go to the movies, uh, for instance, uh, my grandma would say, okay, now let's hit the stalls before we go home. <laughs> <laughs> so we would, she had this huge bag, and we had, and we'd, we'd come home with the toilet. So I just figured we'd be set for another month, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and we would do, and then we'd go to Thrifty's uh, drugstore and sit at the counter and have uh, soda or something like that. And then she'd look around, she'd have this purse and just put everything into it. <laughs> Spoons, you know, all the forks, the knives, mm -hmm. uh, salt and pepper shakers, all of that. You must, yeah. have a, must have had a hell of a collection. Ketchup, too. Really? Yeah. When you were a kid and you see that going on, I mean, what, what was going through your mind? Well, I, we, were, we didn't have any money, so she just said that's the that's way to go about it, and she was right. You know, uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't mean it's right to steal, but uh, that wasn't that big a deal. Mm -hmm. We didn't go. We didn't go to banks. Right. <laughs> or at least if you did, that wouldn't make it in the book, right? Right. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, a lot is made. We, we sort of saw the thing, you know, the ear tug off the top. And, yeah. I mean, your grandmother, your, your nanny. That was, was for my grandmother. Uh -huh. uh, just for people who maybe don't know the story. I mean, yeah. she's a huge. She raised you. Yes. Practically, right? Yes. 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 My tell, grandmother. Tell me about her. Yeah. Oh, well, she was a. Um, I, I lived with her in Texas, and my mom and dad had moved to California to see if they could make their fortune, which it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my grandmother and I followed my mother out to California about a few months later, and she and my dad had uh, parted. And so mama lived down the hall in one place, and then she'd gotten nanny and me, nanny, my grandmother and me, a room uh, just around the corner from where she was. Uh, down the hall. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had a one room and with the Murphy pull-down bed 
which never went back up into the wall because my grandmother was always lying down on it and saying, I don't know if I can live another day. <laughs> You know, and she was always feeling her pulse. But what was funny was she, she, she was a Christian scientist. <laughs> and, and you know, she, but she was a hypochondriacal Christian scientist. So she'd say, okay, now, the, as they say in Christian science, know the truth for me, which means, you know, there's, you're not going to be ill and everything's going to be fine. And so I'd be a little girl and I'd be doing that, you know. And then she'd say, Go get me an aspirin. <laughs> yeah, so it was like, so I got mixed messages and stuff. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but then I found out years later when I was writing a, an autobiography or a memoir, I should say, uh, I found out she. I known that she'd been married three times. That, that I knew, and then I found out that she'd been married six times. <laughs> That's a. That's double. That is double. <laughs> yeah, yeah, found out that. And then uh, she was, she was uh, quite the coquette, evidently, as a young woman, you know. And uh, so she, uh, she had actually um, seduced her second husband, who was, uh, uh, she had taught him piano lessons. And uh, she, uh, uh, he was quite a bit younger. And she and he uh, eloped to Texas from Arkansas, and uh, his mother came and got him. <laughs> yeah. I really like your oh. grandmother. <laughs> she was, well, when she died at 81, she had a 41-year-old boyfriend wow. who was a jazz musician from Redondo Beach. <laughs> yeah, no. But oh, the, uh, one of my favorite stories about her was she didn't really want me to go to New York or she had, uh, she said, you're show business, you're not gonna make it, it's too hard and New York is cold and your blood's too thin, you'll be dead in a week. <laughs> and you know, and all of this. Finally though, I did go to New York, I went and I started to get some work on television. Well, she changed her tune completely, you know, when that happened. And I got on the Gary Moore show, and so things were really cooking for me. And she now would tell everybody she was my grandmother, you know. And she knew everybody in Hollywood, and she would even call the trade papers, like Hollywood Reporter and The Variety, and she'd say, well, why wasn't Carol in the paper today? <laughs> you, know, you know, she's doing this thing over here and with, you know, with Gary Moore, and, and uh, now May, her, her name was May, and uh, yeah, well, yeah, we know, we're, we're on the case, and they loved her. Anyway, she had a very mild, mild heart attack, and uh, I talked to the doctor, and he said, she's fine, you don't have to come out, we're gonna release her in a couple of days, she's just, she's just fine. So uh, my cousin, uh, went to visit her, and I got this from my cousin, and she opened the door, the doors opened for the elevator to the hospital uh, floor where Nanny was, and my cousin saw all of these people lined up in various kinds of costumes uh, leading up to Nanny's door. <laughs> and so, cuz, my cuz opened the door, and there was a little girl in a tutu doing a toe tap and with a baton, and her father was in the corner playing on a harmonica. And the kid finished in a split, and my grandmother said, thank you, I'll tell Carol about you. Now send in the next. There's a whole group of people who know you from the Carol Burnett show, some before, mm -hmm. some of the work you did. You worked on all the talks. You worked with Jack Parr and all those people, yeah. but there's a whole group who know you just as Miss Hannigan. That's right, from Little, little Kids, yeah, yeah. What yeah. Was that? Well, that, that show must have been fun to be a part of. I, I love doing it, uh, to do a musical, and I, with one of my best buddies is Bernadette Peters, and she was in it, and uh, to work with Tim Curry and Albert Finney and all. And to work for John Huston, the director, was uh, amazing, you know. But <laughs> John Houston, well, he also went to the same high school as you. Didn't he also go to Hollywood John? High? I think a whole bunch of them went to Hollywood High, didn't Yeah, he? but he was way ahead of me. Yeah, that way ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but I have, I have a story about Annie. Uh, we, had, we were doing this uh, thing called Easy Street, this number. Easy Street, Easy Street. And in the Broadway show, it was done only by the three villains. 
in the orphanage. And that was a way, it was a showstopper, it was great. So that, this being a movie, they wanted to open it all up, you know, and they had 400 dancers and on the street and we'd go up and down fire escapes and, and, and both uh, Bernadette and Tim Curry and I who were doing, we said, this, this is not working, this is not working. And so um, they finished shooting it, took a week, and I went back to uh, where I lived, and Bernadette went back to New York, and Tim went to England. And I had decided that uh, when I finished, I was going to, I'd always wanted a chin. Do you mean like a literal chin? Yeah, it you was have a fine chin, I, girl. I do now. Uh, <laughs> It was, uh, it was, uh, I was, kind of had a, always a weak chin and I always felt funny doing a profile thing or anything. And there was this ortho, um, oral surgeon in Honolulu who was very good and he said he could fix it by just kind of cutting in here and bringing it out like two or three millimeters. That's all I wanted, you know. And just so I'd have some, something to, you know, like when it rained, I'd like to feel it. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a chin. Uh -huh. Now, um, about a month later, I get a phone call from the producer of Annie, and he said, we're going to reshoot the Easy Street number, and we're going to have it with just the three of you in the thing. And I said, well, Ray, I, 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 I have a chin now. <laughs> And he said, what? And I explained, and he said, oh, with all that Miss Hannigan drag on, it, you know, also, nobody will notice, and it's not going to be picture to picture. We'll do the number, and then there'll be other scenes, and people won't. So now we come back, we re-rehearse it, we're in the uh, uh, orphanage, and we're getting ready to shoot, and Mr. Houston, John, said, well, um, we were in Miss Hannigan's office, going to start the number. He said, I'd like to start back, actually, from uh, when Carol went into the closet to find the locket that belongs to Annie, and we'll pick it up when she comes out of the closet. <laughs> <laughs> so I went up to I said, M -m -m Mr. Houston, he said, Dad, what are you going to call me, John? You know, I said, John. Um, Two months ago, <laughs> when I ran into the closet, <laughs> I didn't have a chin. <laughs> now I'm coming out of the closet, and I, I have, and he thought for a minute, and he said, well, dear, just come out looking determined. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Piece of direction I ever got. I mean, was that funny? <laughs> it's amazing. But Annie is, is, is an important movie and musical for, for, for anybody, but certainly for little girls yes. when they see that. And, yeah. I, and you know, we talked a lot about your grandmother, and we hear about you as this trailblazer, this legendary character for women, a legendary performer for women. And I wondered, what was it about when you were growing up? Did you get lessons? Did your did your mother and did your grandmother tell you about what what it was like when you're growing up? Here's what a woman, because you were there at a time no. when we went to secretary. <laughs> no. Nothing. No. <laughs> No, no. Uh, when I wanted, I wanted to go to UCLA to study, and uh, it cost too much money. And my grandmother wanted uh, me to go to a secretarial school. She said, because if you learn to be a good secretary, you get a good job, and then maybe someday you could nab the boss. <laughs> <laughs> so then, was there ever? When they called you the trailblazer, were you aware at the time no. that that's what you were doing? No, not at all. Not at all. I remember I had it in the contract with CBS, however, that I could do a variety show, an hour variety show, as opposed to a half-hour sitcom. And uh, I had five years to let them know if I wanted to do something like that while I was doing other things for CBS. And so the five years were almost up. and. I made the call to CBS and I said, I think I'd like to push that button and do a variety show. And they had totally forgotten. <laughs> and they said, what? I said, the, <laughs> the variety, the hour variety show. And this was a week between uh, Christmas and New Year's. So I think they got a lot of lawyers out of uh, Christmas parties uh, that night. And they called back the next day and uh, his name was uh, Mike Dan. 
And he said, well, Carol, uh, yeah, we see that. The, the, you, know, you know, though, that's really a man's game. You know, let's say, uh, he said, look, it's, it's, uh, there's no women. Are, I mean, Dinah Shore did a musical variety show, but comedy variety, that's Jackie Gleason, it's, it's Caesar, it's Dean Martin, it's uh, you know, on and on. I said, but that's all I know, and, all I, and I want to have music, I want to have guest stars, I want to do sketches, I want to have a rep company, you know, like Sid Caesar and so forth. And he said, but we have this terrific script that uh, it's a half hour sitcom. It's just, you'd be, uh, it'd be great for you. It's called Here's Agnes. <laughs> So, uh, but they had, to, they had to put it on, and we didn't know that it was going to last or anything. <clears throat> and all I did was just get up there and be the goof that I was on the Gary Moore show and uh, have our beloved Tim Conway and Harvey Corman and Vicky. The, uh, the, the, the thing about that show, I mean, aside from the fact that there was a lot of characters and funny bits, was it was the relationship between all of you. Half the time, even yeah. when, the, when the bits weren't being executed properly, the funniest part was when you just made each other laugh. Well, like that was the biggest part that of that was, show. That was Conway. Yeah? Yeah, that was, that, <laughs> that was Conway. We never wanted to break up. I mean, all of us, Harvey was a consummate, you know, actor and so forth, but he was, uh, it was Tim's goal in life to destroy Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> so we would do, uh, you know, we would do two shows on a Friday, the dress rehearsal and the air show, with two different audiences, and Tim would be just perfect on the dress rehearsal. Like he'd stick to the script. Stick to the script, you know, on all, and then he'd ask the director if he got all the shots fine, then whoosh, off he would go <laughs> on the air show. And sometimes, when he, it was a sketch between him and Harvey, he all he would have to do at the beginning would be to do that. <laughs> To Harvey. Just look at Harvey go. <laughs> Harvey was gone. There was, there was no, I, it, it was impossible. Uh, you, you were still in touch. I know in, in, in later years after the, the Carol Burnett show left television, you guys went back on the road and you, and you did the show. Well, I didn't go on the road with uh, Tim and Harvey. Tim and Harvey went on the together. road together, yeah. And, and they played and, some of those characters oh, that they love so much. Oh, yeah. And we just lost Harvey. I mean, you were pretty we close to him, right? We lost him a year ago. Oh, I, he was like a brother. And um, there was, he had, he, as I say, he was a consummate actor. And, but the, he had the comedy chops of uh, there's nobody, maybe there's somebody as good as Harvey, but I've never worked or seen anybody better. He was, he was, I always put him on a pedestal because he deserved it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was like, I always felt very important to have people to work with who are better than you are. It's like playing tennis with somebody that's better, it's gonna make your game better. And that's what Harvey did for me. Whenever I was with him, I, I grew up to, you know, I, I grew up to his, his level mm -hmm. as well as often as I could. Yeah. You know? The thing about your show is that, growing up watching it with my, with my family as a young boy, uh -huh. I just thought it was, it was a funny show. Uh, year, years later I found out when I, when I talked to girls I know, especially girls who are in the, in the business, um, you gave them, uh, you showed the networks and people that it was okay for girls to be silly yeah. on TV. Did you have an idea that was happening while you were doing it? Nope. I really, I, I never th uh, tried to analyze any of that, really. I just got up and was silly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I wasn't thinking, gee, this is going to help a lot of other girls be silly. You know? <laughs> but, you know, but after the fact, you recognize that yes, that's what I happened, right? Yeah. 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 So what, 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 kind of what kind of conversations do you have with people? I'm sure you meet plenty in the business now. Who, who grew up watching your show and talk about the impact your show had on them? Well, they ask a lot of people ask why, you know, why can't there be more television like that today? Uh, because at one time when we were doing our show, there were nine variety shows. It was us and the Smothers Brothers and Sonny and Cher, Glenn Campbell, Flip Wilson, Laugh-In, Dean Martin. Yeah. You know, it was fantastic group of comedy writers and comedic performers and so forth, and. Uh, you don't see that much anymore. And, you know, it's all kind of reality shows. And a lot of the humor um, gets a little mean. When the curtain came down to the Carol Burnett show, finally, what, what, what were you thinking? That, when, the, when the lights yeah. came down that last time? Oh, well, it was my decision to leave in the 11th year. Harvey had left uh, to do a television show. He left after 10 years. And Tim and Vicky hung on. And I just kind of missed Harvey. And then I... 
uh, found, I saw that sometimes some of the sketches we were doing were almost repeating some of the things we might have done in the seventh year or the eighth year. So, and I said, you know, I, I don't want to stay here and wait for the network to go. <laughs> Bye. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I felt it was better to, uh, to leave before I was asked. I mean, a comedian is an artist, but you know, some musicians have a moment where they're able to write the kinds of songs that seem to connect with an audience and make these great records, and as time goes on, they, it's harder for them, some musicians, to find that song again. Yeah. Can the same be said for a, an artist? Can, can a comedian sit there and go, I don't, I can't write the jokes the way I used to write the jokes? Well, at times, you know, but uh, it, I, it was the material. You know, if I got material that was new and fresh and funny, mm -hmm. we could make it funnier. And um, that, that was what I was, we were always looking for, you know. And uh, so, but there's nothing harder, I don't think, uh, professionally, you know, in the business, than it would be to be a comedy writer. That's, uh, that's it's tough pretty job. tough. Well, That's, they always say, right, it's not funny, it's comedy. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Now, thankfully, because of this audience, we never have to worry about not getting a laugh. But <laughs> when, when, you, when you guys were out there doing your, your bit and there wasn't a laugh, oh. <laughs> what was that like, aside from that? Well, there was one time we, did, we were doing a, a sketch called Mary Worthless. And it was a takeoff on the Mary Worth character, the, the little lady who was always a busybody and getting into everybody's business and so forth. And I was going to be Mary Worthless, and we were thinking that she could be a running character, perhaps every other week or so, you know, if she worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we started doing the sketch, and it was bombing. By that, I mean bad. Woof. Whoa. Just like crickets in the no, studio? No, I'm telling you, the audience was an oil painting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they were looking at and, and finally we get to the end of the sketch, and I'm supposed to say into the camera, now, make sure that you uh, keep watching, because pretty soon maybe Mary Worthless will be coming into your home. You know, because she wrecked this whole thing in the sketch. And then I said, on second thought, don't worry, because I am never going to do this character again. <laughs> uh, okay, so my last question, because you've been so generous with your time. What's your favorite character you've ever played? Well, I, I love all the movie takeoffs yeah. we did, uh, but to, I was always happy when we had a Eunice sketch, when yeah. I did Eunice, and I was always happy. <laughs> Poor, pitiful Eunice. And, uh, and I love doing Mrs. Wiggins yeah. with Tim. Uh, you know, that would be like, uh, uh, Mrs. Higgins. Yes. Where was that accent from? That he I knew? don't know. He, uh, he's, uh, he made it up, I think. He made it up, yeah. Do you still do the Tarzan yell from time to time? Sure. Can you? 